And so um, it was very clear to me that this was an economic problem that needed to be addressed. And so therefore, the way I was going to be able to help wasn't necessarily by going and rescuing mm. um, people in this situation. Um, there was already, uh, I mean, quite a, a lot of people that, that I was aware of in the space. But one thing that they kept saying was that it's fine to rescue someone out of you know these horrible situations they find themselves mm -hmm. in. But it's that next step that we're missing. What happens then, you know? Um, and it was a really high number, uh, the percentage of people that would end up in a worse position as a result of being rescued with nothing to go into than if they had just been left there. And that was really confronting for me. And so mm. I knew I wanted to start something that gave them employment and gave them, equip them with all the things they need so they can be successful on their own. And that was, you know, I didn't have the strategy in my head. I didn't know how to really do it. I just figured it can't be that hard to make jeans if I was going to make anything. You're listening to Justice Matters with Tim Buxton, a podcast inspiring the fight for a world where everyone belongs. Welcome to another episode of Justice Matters, and I've got my good mate, James Bartle, on the show today. He is the founder and CEO of Outland Denim, and he believes that fashion can lead the way in creating a more just world. Um, and his denim company is doing just that. It has received a litany of awards, more, most recently the Thomas Reuters Anti-Slavery uh, Award. Uh, it's a certified B company, which you'll find out what that means a little later in the show. Uh, it's got A plus on ethic reports by various fashion industry reports. Uh, this company truly is doing some incredible things. One of the things I love about James is just how honest and raw and passionate he is. He's not afraid to acknowledge the mistakes that he's made along the way. Um, I'm really grateful that I get the chance to share this conversation that I've had with him, with you, and the opportunity that you're going to have to learn about this amazing brand, Outland Denim. James, thanks for coming in, mate. How are how you doing? Yeah, good. Good, yeah. man. Stoked to be able to come and finally catch up like this. Yeah. First of all, how's how's the family? How's Erica and the... Good, mate. About to have a uh, have a baby any day. So that's yeah. our third little boy. You got a little boy this time. Yeah. Huh? Awesome. Yeah, third time. Third time. Oh, good stuff, man. Yeah. And um, you said any day. Any like... day. Well, she's not due till the end of the month, but it's... Um, Goodness me. But she's she's been early with our first two. And so we've got two little girls. <sighs> and so having a having a... A boy is pretty cool. Yeah, yeah I'm man. Pretty stoked. Oh, dude, you're going to love it. And yeah. um, well, thanks, man, especially for coming down the mountain um, oh. when you probably need to be close by. Oh, no, it should be fine. Yeah. <laughs> oh, good. I'll make sure you give her my love when you get back up there. And, I will. Um, first of all, man, um, I am just so thankful that um, we, we get to catch up. Uh, you've um, been pretty busy of late. Um, I noticed, uh, there was a big share op option or, or, uh, launch, um, for people to be able to invest into Outland Denim. Yeah. Um, and, uh, we'll get into a bit about Outland Denim and, and some of the stuff that's been going on and love to hear a bit more about the history of that. But what I really want to kind of start with is, is just, um, thinking about you and your journey, um, some of the formative, if you look back at your formative years, can can you think about any particular moment? Uh, it could be growing up, it could be you know rec recently, but where you kind of uh, where justice became a real passion point for you, or, or or really fighting for the oppressed became something that that obviously it's, I mean it's oozes out of you um, um, now. But can you think of when that kind of began for you? I think um, a bit of a natural progression, really. I mean, I watched my parents, you know, as I grew up, um, I was always getting out of my bed for, you know, someone who needed um, somewhere to stay, you know. Mm. And so I, I was always watching my parents, you know, serve people that needed something. Mm. Um, they always just loved on community. And so I guess it was always there and always in my face. And I think I've always admired my parents for the sacrifice that I have seen, you know, consistently. Mm -hmm. um, you know, my entire life um, yeah. that they've sort of demonstrated. So I think that's always been there. But it was really, I think, a moment um, for me when, um, you know, I was made aware of 
human trafficking mm-hmm. and and then following that journey through and an experience I had during that that really changed everything for me. It was, you know, to see a really young girl for sale and how scared and vulnerable she was. Um, it was a life-changing mm. moment, you know, and I think having grown up in Australia mm-hmm. um, in a very privileged position, I just was completely naive to the realities that the majority of our world face um, in being vulnerable economically. They're mm. in these terrible situations or, um, you know, having mm. to, you know, sacrifice in ways that, that you and I may not have had to. And so I think it was that realization and then seeing this little girl, it mm. just changed my life. Yeah. And uh, that was on a on a trip that you were on. Is that right? It was, yeah. yeah. So that, that, I mean, that all stemmed out of the first thing. It, like I said, I, I watched the Liam Neeson film Taken yep. and... I remember leaving the movies that night furious, outraged, Mm. wanting to start some kind of vigilante that would come against these bad people in the world Mm -hmm. that were taking advantage of others and stealing and selling them. I just Mm. couldn't believe that was a reality. And I know it's a fictional film, um, but a few years later, um, after a lot of research, um, my wife and I had learnt a fair bit about human traffic and what it looked like. And I got the opportunity to travel with the rescue agency, um, Mm. not to be involved in rescues, but to see what the problem looked like on the ground. Mm -hmm. It was on that trip that... I saw this little girl and, you know, you just couldn't, you couldn't ignore it. I mean, you know, you walk through these red light districts um, where there's lots of ladies for sale, men as well, um, Mm. for sex. And um, to be honest, it didn't confront me that much to begin with. It was like, okay, I've seen this, you know, seen those areas before, Mm. nothing really changed. And to be honest, they looked happy to me. Hmm. But as as we got out of the main areas and into some of the the darker places, that mm-hmm. I saw this this young girl, and it was very clear she didn't want to be there, and she was very scared, very intimidated. And as I asked the the rep that had taken me, I said, you, "What's what's this girl looks like? She's just a kid." And he goes, "Yeah, she does look like just a kid." And he said, it "Actually, looks like it could be her first night. She's really scared." Mm. And I said, "Well, what can we do for her?" And he said, so "Well, awful. James, if you look around, they're so everywhere." Awful. Wow. So. I, I pictured my nieces at the time, mm. you know, I'd do anything to save them if they were in this position. And as I realized later, you know, um, it's not because they choose to be here. It's not because their families choose to be here. Mm. Um, it's because of desperation. And so it was very clear as to what we needed to do. We need to address that issue. What makes them desperate? What makes them vulnerable? Mm. Yeah. Well, man, I, I think, uh, you know, we have very similar upbringings. We, I just found out just before we jumped in here on this on the studio that uh, we were both PKs, Baptist, you know, pastors. Uh, our parents were Baptist pastors and and we both, I guess, carry uh, maybe some of the scars and, and, <laughs> and the, you know, the privilege of, of that, that yeah. upbringing, like you said, having parents that yeah. just really served and modeled that community. But I guess, like you say, it's not until you you can come face to face. We're so far away here in Australia from a lot of these quite um, intense, intense situations. And it's not until you actually come face to face with the reality of it on the ground that really kind of can, you know, turn the switch for you. Um, Yeah, man, it's, um, I guess we we don't really realize i mean there is need here in australia as well there's some some pretty crazy needs um as you start to get below the surface as well and to some of the rural communities here in the cities mm-hmm. you know homelessness and these things and you know i have have been surrounded by those things i've seen those things i've been um, spoken to about those things and for some reason it, it never really resonated with me um it never drove me to want to do something I always had compassion when i saw mm-hmm. someone in need uh, that was a natural thing but to actually go then and do something was, um, I guess, not necessarily the action you would see following an event like that. So um, I don't know why it changed when I had to see something as horrible as I saw with right. my own eyes for it to actually change. But um, made it, it, you know, growing up with the backgrounds that both you and I have, mm. um, it certainly does um, give you an education as to the range of needs that you see within sure. all of our communities yeah, and yeah. that there is a real need for um, coming up with better ways of being able to, you know, be inclusive of inviting people from all backgrounds and cultures and needs um, to feel mm. at home and, and you know, like they, they have purpose and, and a place in their own communities. Right. Well, you you make a real valid point there, mate. That it you actually don't have to go overseas. You actually don't have to go far to to um, 
you know, encounter um, injustice, to encounter people that are in desperate need, and that people that we can fight, we can fight for in our own backyard. And um, yeah, I think that's really really important. Yeah, there's there's no question. I mean, you've you've all people have you know seen the craziest extremes of mm. you know what it can look like abroad, mm-hmm. um, but now. I know that you work with those same people here in Australia and right. um, whether it's a refugee or whether it's um, just s- someone who's n- not able to fit into society as easily as others, um, it's just around us all the time. And I think, yeah. you know, there's this one movie, Pay It Forward. I don't know if sure. you've ever seen yeah, it, but yeah, I just, yeah. I just awesome. love the movie because I think the concept is so brilliant. It's, um, hey, you do something nice for me. It's not mm. necessary that I now return that to you Mm -hmm. but you've done something to help me and now i'm going to look for others to help as a result of what you've Mm -hmm. done for me and if we all continue on this journey this movement grows Mm -hmm. you know and the world changes and does yeah i think the key to actually writing some of the greatest challenges we face today especially on a social level Mm -hmm. is to be able to address it with just love and understanding you Mm -hmm. know Um, and when we can just stop and 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 look at it from through those glasses Things look different, but whilst we look at it in the busyness of life and we don't really stop and slow down and try and understand why that person is in that position, Mm -hmm. we will never be able to understand. If we can't understand or we don't even try to understand, we can never love them. If we don't love them, then nothing changes. You know, we all just want to be loved at the end of the day. That's what we're all looking for. Oh, totally. Wow, man. Yeah, just just stopping and taking the time. Man, I I find that a lot whenever I I see a situation, um, the the moment I'm actually able to stop and maybe put myself in their shoes and ask, well, why are they acting out like that? Or why is, why is, uh, why are they in the situation that they're in? Um, I think when you lead with that kind of uh, element of empathy and ability to learn and to listen, you realize, oh my goodness, there, um, there's so much I can actually do to help in that situation or, um, and not just, help as in a handout but there's there's a way that i can hopefully i uh, give them a voice yeah um to share their their um you know the situation they're in now you chose to go um obviously down a maybe a less conventional route to actually making a difference um in particular when with what you saw um in the realm of of human trafficking yeah and into our slavery work. Um, and you chose to build a, a jeans company. Yeah. Um, can you tell a, a bit about how that came about and, and why you, you went down that route? Well, it was actually on the very first trip, the one that I've already mentioned, mm. where I was made really aware of how bad this this problem was. And it was amongst poor communities that we were, were traveling and, and seeing the, the needs that they had. And so um, it was very clear to me that this was an economic problem that needed to be addressed. And so therefore, the way I was going to be able to help wasn't necessarily by going and rescuing Mm. um, people in this situation. Um, There was already, uh, I mean, quite a a lot of people that that I was aware of in the space. But one thing that they kept saying was that it's fine to rescue someone out of, you know, these horrible situations they find themselves Mm -hmm. in. But it's that next step that we're missing. What happens then, you know? Um, And it was a really high number, uh, the percentage of people that would end up in a worse position as a result of being rescued with nothing to go into than if they had just been left there. And that was really confronting for me. And so Mm. I knew I wanted to start something that gave them employment and gave them, equip them with all the things they need so they can be successful on their own. And that was, you know, I didn't have the strategy in my head. I didn't know how to really do it. I just figured it can't be that hard to make jeans. If I was going to make anything, denim was the, the <laughs> space I wanted to work in. I love denim. Does that have anything to do with your your love for trembly jeans? <laughs> <laughs> Can well, you shed a light? Oh, well, I mean, <laughs> I don't know why, but ever since I was a, a little boy, I've always been very particular about what I like and what I don't like. And, yeah. and jeans had to be just right, even as a little boy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So I don't know, maybe it was, it was meant to be, um, but I just knew I didn't want to create a t-shirt company. You know, I, I was in the hinterland of the Gold Coast. And so I'd seen like every second person I knew had a t-shirt brand. And, you know, mm-hmm. I was like, no, I want to do something that's going to have real, real substance. It's got to, they've got to work hard to learn it. And I didn't know denim was the hardest product to make. And I didn't know it was also the most competitive product in the marketplace. So mm. it was 
absolutely crazy to even start on a journey like this with people who didn't know how to sew. Um, but we started mm-hmm. on that trip. Um, I, I, you know, started working, uh, put a partnership together with an NGO, mm-hmm. a non-government organization and said, look, I want to help in this way. I have a business in Australia. I'm mm-hmm. going to, I'm going to use that business to fund this. Um, we got people around helping and, um, contributing their time, people mm. making donations. And we started to build this little bit of a movement where we could see that it was having a positive impact on those ladies that we first employed. Mm. Um, and then we continued on this journey for about six and a half years before we even launched our brand. And w- it was it was really so that we could prove the, the impact of it being um, as powerful as it is where they themselves made the change. Mm. Our job wasn't to be the white savior, come in and save the day. As much as probably that's the mentality I started with, um, Mm -hmm. I thought I was going to save the day. I realized that actually I I could be really destructive in the way that that my thinking was and the the role I thought I needed to play in this. Mm -hmm. But really what it was, it was a role to facilitate the right things to come together Mm -hmm. um, from education. I like the way you put that, facilitating. Um, Because I think that's... That's really it, isn't it? Yeah. Like even for all of us, you know, mm. um, y- you see, um, you know, your peers, those that have had um, parents or mentors that have equipped them with the tools to make good decisions themselves. Right. They go on to be, um, I don't know, I don't like calling it successful, but, you know, mm. um, have a much more, I think, stable life yeah. than those that weren't equipped with that, that were given things, but weren't taught how to right. use the tools. And uh, so I think that's really that's what we where we come from with Outland Denim is, is mm-hmm. to equip them with the things they need to be successful themselves. And sometimes that comes in hard love and sometimes that comes in compassion. Right. Always has an educational component yeah. to it. Because it's creating opportunity that otherwise they would not have, right? Exactly. And it's yeah. often the, the inability to have the same access to networks, opportunity or to training and education. Absolutely. That is the, some of the most more systemic problems you have to yeah. kind of come up against yeah yeah there's no question i I, uh, I get really excited that you know um we've been able to prove that you know business um holds a really vital key to some of the big issues that we do face today, whether it be social environmental economic problems right i think business is actually one of the most exciting spaces to be right now we're in a yeah. very unique time in history where yeah. businesses can actually use the power that they have to change people's lives or change the outcomes on industry and on environmentally or, and so forth. Right. And I think, yeah, like if businesses that are successful right now changed the way they operated and did things, it would have a major impact. And if Huge. new businesses that started came in with that socially conscious um, approach to the way they do it, we can make a huge impact, which kind of leads me to my next question, which is, we we caught up, you know. We've we've kind of been in touch over the years. I remember, I don't know, it was three or four, maybe five years ago, when we caught up um, at uh, um, was it was it Jason's house? Whose whose pad was yeah, it? Yeah. Anyway, so, uh, good, yeah, a good there, yeah. mutual friend's house, and um, you were chat- chatting to me how you kind of sh- started out with a more of a charity model, yeah, and you shifted to that more business. Or social enterprise model. Yep. Um, can you can you talk us through a yeah. bit about that? Because I reckon there'd be a lot of people that might be running a charity or want to start a charity. And I remember you specifically. I was just getting you belong. I think yep. um, going at the time or uh, had had some traction heading there. And you're like, if I were you, Tim, just consider this as an option. Yeah. It's going to be a lot easier, yeah. save a lot of heartache. Can you talk a bit about that? Yeah, well, we started as a not-for-profit, and the reason was that I felt it was the most purest way of saying, hey, world, um, I want to make this impact. I want to work with these people, and this is not about me. This is right. And, and actually, the further into it I got, the more I realized how much pride was involved in that. I wanted to be a martyr. I wanted to be somebody mm-hmm. who was prepared to give up everything to help these marginalized people. And mm. I didn't realize how much pride was in that at the time. And it took, it's taken years and still I discover things in myself. I'm like, oh my gosh, wow. Like that's really the reason I was making that decision or this decision. Right. But that's a lifelong battle, isn't it? You know, sure, like dealing mate. with those things inside that. I feel like I'm <laughs> constantly yeah. up against that myself. Yeah. yeah. And we all are. Um, mm. But um, I had another business I was using to fund it. And I nearly killed this business. I was just taking everything out of it that I could to put into Okay trying to have this impact. And I realized that I I had a couple of ways of um, financing this thing. Cash was the thing that stopped it from having any power. 
I either had to apply for grants and win grants, and then I go into competition with all the other amazing charities and not-for-profits around the world mm -hmm. that need that money too, mm -hmm. or I go and get investors and I get cash. Mm -hmm. But I can't get investors with the not-for-profit. Mm -hmm. I had to look at the structure and I, I just went to to um, all the other stakeholders and I said, this is what I want to do. Mm. Um, I don't want to do it without your blessing. Um, I got everyone's blessing and I went out on my own. And it was really scary because it's like, okay, now I've got no backing whatsoever. Um, it's only my business. Um, you know, no one could make a donation. No one could help in that way now that I'm a for-profit business and um, which we call profit for purpose. Mm -hmm. And so um, we went down this road and I started getting investors on. And as I brought investors on, we had cash flow. And as I had cash flow, everything changed. You know, we were wow. for once able to invest into the, the things that we needed to be able to create yeah. genuine lasting change. But um, I had to make that big shift. And, and again, it was, it was game changing for, for what we do, um, but all because of cash flow. Mm. Um, actually there's a, um, there's one thing that really helped me jump over that line too. And it was, um, um, B Corp. I don't know if you've heard of B Corps, but, um, it was probably the one thing that gave me the courage to do it. And it, what it, what it is, is, um, it gives you uh, a certification, you become a B Corp. Yeah. Um, and that means they audit your business and you're a for profit business, but they audit you to see what it is you're doing, what's important to you and basically score you on whether you can even get B Corp cert certification mm -hmm. or or not and um, going through that process meant that okay there's still um, a, a governance level there that's um, outside of our own um, board that that's going to be looking in and, and um, uh, not advising but um, keeping you accountable keeping us well. accountable to right, yeah. to what it is we say Standards. we stand for yeah and so that was really cool so when i saw that that was probably the catalyst that made me go yep i'm going to for profit because now this exists i remember having to wait i think it was a, a year or so it had passed legislation in the u.s it was had moved into australia hadn't passed legislation here in australia so we weren't able to be, mm -hmm. become a b corp yet so i had to wait a year um until that was through and then i um went well, through the process i find that pretty interesting because um you know, sometimes nonprofits and and that whole charity realm can kind of get by a little bit without being being held to the high standards of audits and 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 I guess accountability as well. You know, because mm. you've got a lot of volunteers and a lot of yeah. most people are just really giving yeah. giving their time um, sacrificially yeah. to make sure those things happen. And so That's sometimes right. you kind of can give them a bit more grace when they don't get it right. But I love how you kind of embraced the almost, no, it's important that we, we, you know, lead with integrity as well as a yeah. business. Now you've, I've got, I've got a printout here um, because there's two page, two pages full of all the awards that Outland Denim has kind of has achieved in in the last couple of years and it's super impressive it's got obviously your your b uh, certified corporation which stands for best for the world um and and you're in the top 10 percent of that currently mm. at the moment you've got global fashion agenda awards um you've got i mean it's just the list goes on the winner of the thomas reuters stop slavery award 2020 this year um a plus in ethical fashion report you guys are leading the way and and you did have some, obviously, um, people have been supporting that. Uh, you had Meghan Markle come behind you and other well-known um, people that have obviously realized what an incredible impact you're having, that, which has really helped you. Now, what what has been, I guess, I guess how, how important, I would say, has it been for you to kind of go after, and you don't go after awards for the sake of awards, but how is important for it is you to kind of hold to that level of 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 excellence um, and integrity as as you move forward as as a brand. I think it's really important, um, and the reason is that um, if you want to change something that's um, you know as wrong as what the fashion industry has become, mm -hmm. um, wrong on so many levels, yet has the ability to be an absolute life-giving industry. Um, mm. One in six people in the globe work within it. 
if you want to be somebody who can challenge and change, you said industry, one in six people in the world work within the fashion industry, the fashion some industry at some level. Mm. So if you want to change the world, statistic. it's an amazing industry to do it through. Wow, we all wear it. Um, sure. So um, you know, it's it's a great place to start. Food would be another incredible place to do it. Right. Um, but I go. Then you need to be an industry leader. Mm. And you know what's what's crazy is I actually don't. You know, people call us. Um, uh, you're the disruptors and, you know, and I don't, I just don't like the term. It's like, yes, as much as we're disrupting a, a way that things have been done, we're not actually here to disrupt and um, make things worse. We're here to, we're here to go come in and go, Hey, we found a better way. Mm. Um, now that's taken a lot of investment. It's taken a lot of time. It's taken a lot of risk, but actually the changes we've made aren't that big. We get called innovators all the time. And there is some really cool innovations that we've we've been able to do yeah. in, in the pipeline. But but really, it's not that innovative. It's actually just going, hey, how would you want to treat mm. people? Um, if you treat people like that, what's the outcome of that? Can you measure that over time? What's What are we going to be able to show to the world? If you buy this product, it means this. Um, and so it's really just that journey that I guess has has set us apart um, while we've been able to experience that. You, you mentioned the Thomson Reuters Foundation um, Stop Slavery Award. I mean, that's the biggest award we've ever won. And the reason for that is Thomson Reuters, as you know, I mean, such an yeah, incredible incredible yeah. body of, to, to uh, I guess, give you their stamp of approval. Sure. But the, the Stop Slavery Award is why we started, um, not the award, but stopping slavery is why we started. Now, slavery doesn't just mean, um, you know, those that we picture like in um you know the films the yeah. films yeah. it's 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 those that are oppressed by you know marginalized it's it's the the hurting people that's how i see it you know mm -hmm. um you know we obviously have people in garment factories as slaves in you know mm -hmm. brothels as slaves in households as slaves mm -hmm. um but it, it goes much broader than that you know and, and what we need to address and if you could become an industry leader and you could influence an industry that has the power to touch the lives of one in six people mm. then could you change the world you know mm. is poverty something that has to be with us i don't believe it has to be with us mm. i believe it's because of the choices that we make in the way that we run our industry um all industries um all the way down to our personal decisions on mm. what we buy what we support mm. um but my goal would be that if you become if we could become an industry leader and if we could prove that this is financially viable, viable, but in fact, mm. even more profitable than doing it the other way, then what would happen? You know, would the world change? Would we start looking at things like poverty as being something of the past? Mm. And I, I said earlier, you know, I think that we're in a very unique time in history. I think this, this time will mark history as when industry stepped up and changed things. We might think government's in place to be able to address the social needs of our community, but I don't believe that. I believe that we are in place to address the needs of our community. And so if we use our businesses to do right. this, things will change. Well, yeah. I mean, it, it's personal responsibility then, yeah. isn't it? It's easy to kind of say, well, if if the government did this different, um, and rightly so, governments need to reform, policies need to change. But if we say, oh, well, it's up to the St. Vinnie's or these charities to be the ones, and I'll just give them, them my money to, you know, to do what they do, then again, we're kind of avoiding the personal responsibilities of, of the day-to-day -day things that we do, how we shop, how we, um, you know, um, at, live as consumers because right. we're all consumers. We we're are. consuming products. We drank our McDonald's coffee before this and uh, we all are participating one way or another in the economy in that re respect. Um, but so from a personal perspective, this obviously hasn't been an, an easy journey for you. Um, I couldn't imagine anyway. Um, it takes a lot of hard work to set up a company whilst uh, running another business, whilst having a young growing family. Can you talk about maybe some of those challenges to get there? Because, you know, we don't want to paint this thing with rose colored glasses either no. and, and, and be like, you know, you're going to just get out there and it's just, it's as simple as one, two, three, you know. Well, you know all too well with your own journey. I mean, I, right. we we often, often, uh, my wife Erica and I would talk about you guys and watching you over there and in a in a really 
tough country in a tough environment, you know, loving on people and, and risking so much to be there. Um, and that being absolutely inspirational for us and part of our journey. And that, that r- r- is a real thing. It's like you, you need, you need stuff to look at. You need others to look at and go, man, they're doing it. Like, you know, I got to keep going, you know, be inspired by others. Um, mm. But man, the journey is hard. And, you know, I've had my lowest moments in here. I remember mm. the first time, I'm not an anxious person and I'm very optimistic about most things. And um, But I remember sitting on the side of our bed. My wife had never seen me with anxiety and I was just gripped by it because Sorry, I didn't know man. how tomorrow I was going to pay the wages of these people in mm. Cambodia who desperately rely on this. You know, the consequence for not paying them is high. Mm. Um, it's not like here in Australia where we've got welfare and we can mm. probably go to someone we know and, and get some money or stay at their place or eat at their place. You know, it's not necessarily like that for all of our staff. And I'm just thinking, my gosh, I can't, I can't, um, I can't pay them. What mm. are we going to do? But miraculously, like so many occasions through this journey, a bill would be paid mm. or something would happen and I'd have wow. the money. You know, I could draw some money from here or borrow some money from there or, you know, and I've just had to do that the whole way through. Mm. I remember emptying a milk bottle full of um, gold coins that my uncle had given me. And that's how I could afford to get the next flight back to do the next thing. And, you know, it has been hard. And and, and one of the most incredible um, outcomes of the challenge, because I think the challenge has to be there. And in fact, if it's not there, I think right. you don't actually get to reach your potential. Um, so... The hardship is really good. And all of last year, my goal was just to see the hardship as an opportunity. If I can feel peaceful amongst the chaos wow. and the not knowing, and I can still be joyful and peaceful, imagine how much could be achieved, you mm. know, if you could be in that place. And I'm, I can't say I'm quite there, um, but I'm still working toward that. And every time I see mm. one of these next challenges, I go, this is my next opportunity to see if I can get through this one a little better than I did the last one. Um, wow, man. But I know that there's always a way. And to always say to my staff, you know, it looks like it's not possible to us today, but I know that there is a way. If we're committed, if we really want to stay true to what we're called here to do, which is to love and look after these this particular people group right now, then we will find a way. Mm. And I mean, this is 10 years I've been in this for now. Our brand's only four years old, but there was six and a half years of oh, development before that. Totally. And we're still wow. here. And man- I've had no food in the fridge. You know, I'm, my mm-hmm. wife and I looked at each other one night years ago now. We laughed. And we're like, we literally don't have food. <laughs> what a cool experience. You know, <laughs> how awesome is that? But you know, it's only a really small mm-hmm. insight into what it's like for these other people. I could have gone down the road and asked somebody for some food. Right. They don't necessarily get to do that. Mm. Um, so it's really cool that we get to be challenged in this way and just learn to be better at those challenges. So lean into the challenge is my advice for anybody. Like wow. don't see it as woe is me. See it as, oh, that's really cool. But because many people don't, man, they get to go through life just cruising, but the substance isn't there. Right. But you keep getting beat down and get back up, beat down and get back up. You get stronger every time you get better mm. at it and wiser. And, you know, so I think, I think we just need to embrace the challenges and the hardship. Man. If I was in a church, I'd say preach it, man. <laughs> um, but I will. I, thanks for being so, um, I guess, honest and open with with those challenges. Um, uh, I feel you with the anxiety, with the the you know the the dark days, the weight of responsibility you have carrying it, carrying a family, young family, and also, you know, so many people that rely on um, on the live for their livelihoods mm. on, on this, uh, on Outland Denim going and being successful. Justice Matters is brought to you by You Belong. If you'd like to learn more about their work, empowering refugees to integrate and thrive in Australia, head on over to youbelong.org.au. There you'll find ways to get involved, volunteer and financially get behind the several initiatives they've got going on. There's also a stack of articles and blogs that you'll find there that are really informative and engaging. Now, did you know this podcast is actually a video podcast featured on YouTube? Just search Justice Matters TV on YouTube and watch each episode right there. And while you're there, 
hit subscribe and get notified each time a new video drops. Um, can you can you talk a bit about maybe some of the more the more challenges as a as a brand as well? Um, yeah. I'm thinking we're like in the middle of this coronavirus pandemic, you've had a, a launch for investment. I mean, there's, it's not been easy as you've yeah. alluded to. There's times when you've, you're not, not sure if we'd be successful enough, but uh, I'm sure people out there would love to hear, you know. Yeah. Man, the <laughs> business has you... absolutely had like massive challenges and, you know, um, I don't know how we're still here. I, I really mm. don't. So much of the time, like I've said, you know, we've had no money. I can't pay wages yet. You know, we have 100 staff in Cambodia. Because everyone thinks, right, oh, you know, you, you look at the Instagram post and you've got, you know, Meghan Markle and other famous people promoting it and suddenly, mm. oh, that must just mean you yeah. can just sit back on your laurels and, yeah, do. and everything just, rich. Yeah, 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 everything's just yeah. fine. But yeah. we all know, you know, yeah. that that uh, that just in some ways can make things more difficult, right? Well, well, that experience, absolutely. That's a great example of one that made it really difficult. Uh, it was really good, and, uh, and I'm so grateful for the support of Meghan Markle, and she's she supported us on so many occasions now. Um, mm. You know, like we see amazing things where the media will say, oh, Meghan and Harry have just gone out in L.A. somewhere. Um, we know it's this shirt and these shoes. We presume it's her favorite Outland denim jeans. You know, mm. no one even knows. You know, so like it's pretty incredible, man, to have that, and that's uh, it speaks to who she is as well. I think she's sure. a pretty amazing human mm. um, to support brands. She's always looking for brands to exactly. to, to help. But um, you know, she wore it, and um, we had just launched in the top two department stores in Canada. Mm. We'd just launched uh, or signed with David Jones to to launch here in Australia. Um, so we were growing really quickly. Mm. And then on top of that, Meghan Markle turns up in Dubbo here in Australia. Yeah, yeah, I remember that. <laughs> gets off this plane wearing Atlan jeans. I just arrived in Cambodia the um, the the night before. So I woke up because it's three hours um, behind over there mm -hmm. in time. And my phone is going mental and find out that's like Meghan Markle's worn Atlan denim jeans. Media's going mad. Like... There's the TV appearances. They they want someone to speak on this. It's like so. I jumped on a plane and left straight away, thinking this is amazing. Um, can't believe it. I had my um, sales manager with me at the time in there, and he's like, his phone just going notified every time there was an online sale, and it was just going ding, ding, ding. You know, oh, it was no. incredible. We're like, whoa, like <laughs> man, I wish we had more product because mm -hmm. we sold out a product really quickly, and you know they really want what she wears. There's a little bit of overflow, but mainly if she wears this jean, they want that jean. So our Harriet Black has become famous because of uh, Meghan yeah. Markle. But um, what followed was this incredible amount of growth. I had to employ 46 new seamstresses as a as a direct result of wow. what happened there, which is a, a great Fantastic. thing. Yeah, you know, that's that's achieving what our goals are: is to yeah. bums on seats, you know, mm. vulnerable people. But man, like managing that now, we've got exposure internationally. We've got department stores internationally mm. that are wanting to look at collections and we're not ready. And so we're having to hustle. And man, honestly, we lost the culture during that period of time of what Outland is and how we treat our people and love our people. And when you lose guidance there because you're all hustling so hard, you take your eyes off what's really important. Mm. And it doesn't mean the way we treat people, but just in we're here to work and we're focused on this only rather than, hey, man, are you okay today? Mm. You know, um, that was a really tough period where I feel like we could have fallen over. Mm. Um, we made it through and, you know, we're ready to grow again. We've, we've spent the last mm. year and a half really stabilizing as a company. But then to go into a pandemic like this mm. where... Um, I've never experienced anything like this. I don't. I don't have a game plan. I go to YouTube, learn how to do lots of things, but mm -hmm. YouTube isn't able to tell me how to manage this. And so, I um, really have to rely on you know, I guess what you've learned over time. And um, mm. you know, I've got a really strong Christian faith, and I, I really mm. rely on that mm. to make decisions. You know, from a worldview point of view, it's like what's important, and my faith tells me what's important, and yeah. I and I focus on those things. And you know, to date. Um, that's really why we've been successful is it's like what's important? People are important, you know, mm. focus on the people, love the people, create opportunities for the people. Yes, you need to have the the economic side of your business functioning well. But, if, man, if you marry them both, then you supercharge a business. Yeah. And so, yeah, you know, you talk about some of the brands that, that don't necessarily value that human component of their business. And I don't just mean their direct that work at HQ with them, but I mean those right down in the at supply every chain. level, yeah. 
they don't value them. And so over time, they're going to lose faith. And as consumers become more wise to the realities of our fashion and the choices they make, they're going to back brands like Outland Denim. That's what we're seeing now. Mm. Our sales have increased direct-to-consumer sales, as many brands have online at the moment. Our mm-hmm. exposure has increased. Our um, opportunity to be able to see um, the the outcomes in poor communities that we have seen has increased. You know, So the opportunity is bigger now as a result of COVID. Um, Black Lives Matter. It's another one. Yeah, I was going to say, like, even as that has kind of become an uh, an issue that we've had to, we really need to put a lot of focus on as it's as it's come to light in recent events. Um, I love the fact that you've been willing to stop, listen, learn, and even make those course corrections in your own own company. Yeah. Can Can you talk a bit about how you've done that? For sure. Um, well, I remember, you know, the the media, we had to, as a brand, make a stand. Where do you stand? And the media are pretty ruthless with this these days. Hey, there's a big social or big issue going on. Where do you stand as a brand? Because we want to know whether we cancel you from society or not, you know. Sure. So that's, it's a pretty scary thing to be a brand and Social today. media can be hard because they'll, it'll take any anything that you put out there and it can be weaponized into any direction anyway. that anyone goes at. But Absolutely. to not say something is to say something, right? So I believe so. For um, Not necessarily for everybody, but I think when you've got um, a responsibility like our brand does where you do have some small level of influence over your community um, or within your community, not over, but you do have to say something. And so I, I remember when and they- And for, for, for people that have- you know, a strong core conviction, their yeah. faith that people do matter, yeah. that people are equal regardless of race, ethnicity, exactly. background, whatever the case might be. It's there. There is an obligation, really, isn't there, for us to? There is. There, there really is. And you know, I, I struggled as you know, it came across my desk, and my first reaction was, "This, this is horrible. What's going on?" But as a brand, we can't speak up about this. Um, because that's not the battle we're fighting. That was my first thought. And I and I went home and I really thought about this and I just got deeply convicted. Mm. Deeply convicted of like Hey man, thanks for your honesty. I mean, I, most of most people wouldn't admit to that. Yeah, well, I just journey. thought about those people that feel that way. Mm. I'm not talking about why mm. you know, people feel that way. I'm not talking about what the solution is. I'm not talking about any of that. But there was a question that was really clear to me that 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 the black community were asking, do I matter? Mm. And my answer to that is you Mm, matter. Now, I don't align with the Black Lives um, Matter organization. Um, This is, I'm answering this question. Do you matter? Absolutely, you matter. And I'm, I'm, I'm so sad that that's a question that needs to be asked. You know, I'm so sad about that. Um, And, and then I had to look internally and go, wow, I've actually been a part of this problem. Mm. Not because I don't see them as someone with a different skin color as equal. It's Mm. because I've grown up in a society where there is, you know, some major issues. You know, um, Mm. some of the sayings, man, like that I've only just been made aware of, like are horrifying. Um, Eeny, Mm. meeny, miny, mo, catcher. Mm. I thought it was Tigger. By mm-hmm. the toe. Mm-hmm. They were real sayings in community. Mm-hmm. So when I see people stand up and fight this, I go, you don't think there's a pr- problem you know, yeah. with our society when they were real sayings that we were teaching our children to run around and catch a mm. – like crazy, man. So I, I see as a brand like we have a responsibility. I, I love people. Mm. Um, skin color doesn't, doesn't matter, um, you know. So we have to now – Incorporate Adjust. more mm. visual uh, visuals into our campaigns of all kinds of people, not just black people, like people from all different um, ethnicities backgrounds, and ethnicities, backgrounds, yeah. you know. Um, so we're going to do that. And also then size. Size has been one that's been put across my table mm-hmm. for years. Mm. And I always go, hey, yeah, I get that. And I, I mean, I, but we're fighting this one battle has always been the thing. Hey, I don't want to take my eyes off. I know that this is what we're fighting for. We're mm-hmm. fighting for this. And those things do matter, mm-hmm. but we're fighting for that. I'm not going to take my eyes off. And it was through this that I realized, like, so as much as somebody with black skin doesn't feel like they belong, like or, they belong yeah. or 
neither does somebody who's of a different size to your typical sample sizes mm -hmm. that we we make samples in one size, mm -hmm. they're shipped over, we have to find a model that fits that size mm -hmm. and we shoot them. Mm. We've just gone with a traditional model. Mm. It takes a long time to change that and get your systems to change right. and we're in that process now, but... So there's this systemicness yeah. to it, isn't it? Yeah. It's not something that's just, it takes courage and, and man, I'll, I, you know, we are all on a journey of discovery mm. um, and to how, you know, whether we've been knowingly or not being complicit to yeah. a society that hasn't valued everyone equally. Yeah. And, um, and I love the fact that you're willing to make those changes because so often we think that they're compartmentalized issues. But at the end of the day, um, more and more there, we, I realize that they are all one and the same. Oh, man, it's, it's, and, and so it's, as, this is, these are the hard things, you know, even you can be out there thinking you're doing the best thing you can be. And again, nah, you can do better. And yeah. it's that, yeah. that strive to know we've got to do better. We've got to acknowledge where, where we can. And, and uh, social media is very scary today, <clears throat> so intimidating. Um, mm -hmm. And unfortunately, it's become such a, an unhealthy place in lots of situations. But I, I, my experience so far has been we've had a lot of pushback and we, we of course, get nasty comments and, and yeah. all of that. But overwhelmingly, yeah, we get a lot of support. Yeah. And if you're going to be real and authentic, mm. I don't believe... Um, generally, you're going to be crucified for it. Mm. But you do need to be real and authentic. Right. And you can't so, virtual signal. You can't kind of pretend that you care, but you don't really. Which is... I mean, which it is, has to be. It has to be. And I think that's... I mean, that's what we believed as a brand we needed to, on this particular issue with Black Lives Matter, we needed to stop and go, mm. oh, okay, I don't know where we stand on this. Haven't thought this through. And, you know, I mean, I copped a, a bit of... A bit of slack from the side and 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 respectfully like yeah. most of it was respectful um on hey but do you know and i go yeah i get that the media don't necessarily report things accurately all the time but i'm not speaking about any right. of those things yeah. all i'm saying the black lives matter you matter yeah is there lots of things that need to change in every camp absolutely 100 sure. percent. yeah you know this is a moment in time yeah. this is an this is something that we can and yeah Man, thank you. Uh, there's, um, I, I love that it's been a journey, 10 years, like you say, yeah. six and a half years of actual development and, yeah. and the rest of actually kind of being a, a, a public brand. Um, and I believe it's only the beginning. Can you highlight anything that's kind of coming up and exciting yeah. for Outland Denim moving forward? Because, um, you know, I've, I've, I've been privy to some conversations, but... Yeah. Uh, yeah, why don't you? Man, there's so much that's exciting. You know, I look at the space and it's so big and I go, if, I, if if you measure, if you start measuring business off of the three elements that it needs to be measured off, off of our social return on investment, mm -hmm. our environmental return on investment and our economic return on investment, if we if we measure all three of those things together, what could be built? Um, it's, it's incredible and yeah. now's the time for that. So a brand is one thing. But imagine if we could open this up to be able to produce for other brands. What mm. if we could get these other brands that already have influence and power mm -hmm. and now start making their stuff so that their brand has the same kind of influence as Outland Denim has? Mm -hmm. Then you supercharge the brand um, or, the, or the movement or the impact that can be had. And oh, so yeah. we've just finished our very first um, production run for Karen Walker, mm -hmm. um, who's an incredible brand to start with based on the fact that the brand cares about these things. Mm -hmm. um, she's an icon in the fashion industry. Um, we're sampling for a second brand at the moment. And really that's the future. Um, that is, is to produce for other brands as well as Outland Denim um, and just build them to be household names that people think I need denim. It's Outland Denim. Yeah. Um, I believe that product is the answer to solving these things. Imagine if you just go and buy a pair of jeans that you love. Mm -hmm. And then you realize that the byproduct of that was that you changed the people's lives that made it, that made, but not yeah. just the ones that made it, not just the cotton farmer, not the, all those people in the supply chain, but the retailer. You know, today we hear about going direct to consumer because mm. there's more margin. That's again, because we're measuring only one measure. What if we support the bricks and mortar retailer? Mm. What if we 
um, support the sales associate on the floor? What if we support the consumer with the things they need to be able to talk about it and create this movement to be even greater and stronger and more powerful than it, than it is? Then you have something that's really holistic. But at the moment, we don't see that happening in lots of business, especially in the entrepreneurial world. You know, it's direct consumer, cut out the cut out mm. the middleman. It's like let's not support right. the like, local business. But people or... rely on this. Yeah. Our communities rely on retail. Yeah. And retail is where we get to interact a lot of the time mm-hmm. and socially. And it's so it's it's a good thing. And mm. so I the byproduct of our genes is that you support people from the beginning to the end of that process of creating mm. and selling a product. Um and then environmentally, I was say. you change the outcomes on it, our environment. So what if mm. the world was left environmentally in a better position as a result of creating a product mm. and the people were too? What well, would how happen? do you do that? It's possible. Yeah. It's possible. And we're working on things, which I can't tell you today. I, I want to, um, but man, they're game changing. Like yeah. if you can turn fashion into something that's good, you know, you see the CSIRO and the things that they're working on with cotton, and you you look at the the denim mills around the world and the dyeing processes and the reduction in water and the things that we're See, working on, it's just incredible. I, I just love the energy and the passion for like we're not just going to settle for hit, for this one thing. We're going to just go after the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. Well, I think, man, it's it's unfortunately um, we have settled. And see, there's there's new studies now that will actually link um, uh, slavery. To environmental degradation. Wow. So when I see the environment um, uh, being uh, destroyed in the communities we work within, I mean, it's sad because I know that that has a direct result on the people we care for. Right. But we see this movement, right, where this global warming thing, this mm-hmm. all of these issues, which are real issues that we need to address, address yeah. but they forget the people. Slow mm-hmm. fashion is a thing right now, you know, and I'm just making the statement here that slow fashion is not the answer. It might be the best thing we have right now on an environmental level, but man, the the impact that will have socially in poor communities is devastating mm. if we reduce our consumption. So there has to be a better way than that. And that's what I'm committed to. I'm mm. going to find the way that you address both these issues with one product. And if you can do that with one industry, you can do it with all industries. And so I believe the future is really bright if we continue to innovate and believe that it can be done. We've got like a thousand investors in our brand now. You yeah. alluded to it earlier. Yeah, those investors are in real impact investors. One of the greatest challenges I've faced actually in raising investment is that um, investors aren't very educated here in Australia around mm. real impact investing, and so and how to measure that and how to put value on that. And so we went to the to the crowd. We went to you know the Australian and international community. And we ended up with over nine. 900 uh, Australian investors who say, and 80 something percent of them said that they were there because they were there to have impact with their investment. They all expect a return. Mm. We're here to have impact. That's the new way that businesses are now going to raise money. They're going to go to the crowd. They're going to raise small amounts where people aren't risking as much. Mm. They're going to get the values for the companies that they need to get. And there's lots of good reasons for keeping that. Um, But then- you're going to see these kinds of initiatives have a real go. They haven't been able to have a go in Australia because impact investors don't really know how to. Right. They're, they're not not there yet. They're evolving because it's mm. quite new. Um, so we've got a lot of amazing impact investors out there that are that are keeping up. And this equity crowdfunding um, model yeah. model that's you know only a, only a year old here in Australia mm. is speeding that process up. So Love I'm it. I'm pretty optimistic about what the future looks like, not just for Outland Denim, but for lots of those that are out there trying to carve a new way because industry, the way it's been done, hasn't worked. Mm. We've seen that over a long period of time now. So now it's time to do something new and it's happening. Yeah, man. Well, I'm excited. I I am proud to say I'm one of I'm one of Outland Denim's investors and I was able to get on that mainly because I knew you and I believed obviously in in the work that Outland has, has Denim has done. Thank is there know. a way for for people to get involved still? Like, is that option still available? I don't. I... It's going to open up. We're actually okay. going to open this up. Um, so we had such success from this this campaign. I yeah. mean, and again, it was in the worst possible time. We were right. advised to stop. Right. Don't go ahead with this. As You're not pandemic. going to be success. We're the fastest company to hit our minimum target that they've had. Um, wow. You know, it was it was 
epic. It yeah. was amazing. Blew us away. But what we've realized is the real power isn't the money you raise. The real power is you. Mm -hmm. um, the real power is those thousand investors we now have that are out there as brand ambassadors are talking about our brand, supercharging our brand. So if we are able to increase that, what if we had 3,000 investors? What would happen to the brand? I mean, if we're really here for impact, mm. um, giving it every chance it's got of being successful in a retail store. Mm. Let's just say we launch a new Nordstrom store. Because you're in the US now, right? We are, yeah. Yeah, uh. we've launched with Nordstrom and Bloomingdale's. Obviously, it's a really tough time for them. Right. You know, This is a great opportunity for brands to support them, mm. you know, um, to see that they can still be there, you know, next year. Right. Um, so our investors have the opportunity to be able to be a part of that journey. Mm. Um, and then... I guess at the end of the day, hopefully they also then receive better uh, dividends than they would from their other investments mm. um, to be able to continue the journey on to just mm. um, make sure the momentum continues. Oh man, I feel like every time I chat with you, I'm like ready to just <laughs> go and 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 start a, a social enterprise and, <laughs> and 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 try and make a difference. That I know Outland Denim is. Um, if you want to buy a pair of your jeans, um, I'm. I'm wearing my trusty dusties nice. right now, but um, where where do they go? Outland, outlanddenim.com.au in yep. Australia, or just .com in the US. Yeah, um, you know we've got warehouses um in in both regions and also in Europe as well. Yeah, um, we're in the UK, so we can we can deliver directly. But then we've also got Nordstrom's for women's in the yep. US, Bloomingdale's for men's. Um, David Jones East here. West Coast, David Jones here in Australia. And you know, uh, people say, "Oh, how do we? How do we support you? And um, can we make a donation?" And I said, yeah. "No, you can't." But if you want to support us, buy a pair of jeans. Actually, by buying a pair of jeans, it's way greater than if you gave us a two hundred dollar donation. Right. It has a way greater impact. It's about buying the product, loving the product, talking yeah. about the product. But if you don't like it, don't buy it. You know, yeah. like we don't want charity. No, purchase. they're great jeans. We, we they want last. Yeah, they're, they've been my best jeans that I've ever owned. So uh, <laughs> I'm pleased to hear that. Um, yeah. And I'm not just saying that because yeah, cool. uh, you're a mate. But um, And they can learn more about about you as, as a company, as a brand too, by going there. and Because and, yeah. like you said, you want people to be informed consumers. You want Absolutely. them to know that they're actually having an impact yeah. and making a difference. And um, I've got one last question for you. Yeah. Um, uh, as we wrap this up, I try and ask all my, my guests this. And uh, it it's simply this. Why does justice matter? to you oh man that's that's a deep question i don't know how you can answer that yeah. quickly um it can't not matter mm. it can't not matter um i don't know how any human believes that they could be that it could be right that they have more privilege than someone else you know mm. so when i look at the world it doesn't matter who you are or where you come from i think you deserve the same the same love and um, we don't all get the same opportunities. Life isn't mm -hmm. fair, but that's not really what this is about. Justice matters in that I will do everything I can to love and support those that I come into contact with. Mm -hmm. um, and if we all do that, then, man, the world is a much nicer place to be. Mm. Thanks, James. I really appreciate you taking the time to come in, man, and you've lived it. And I'm grateful for your friendship. And uh, what can I say? Well, thank you, man. All the best. No, I appreciate it, Tim. Um, mm. You've been an inspiration to me and my family and others in, in my office as well as we've watched your journey and your family's journey and your wife as well, man. Like you, you yeah. take her to the craziest places like, oh, and your kids and the things they would have experienced. And so like we just go, man, I, I love being able to rub shoulders with someone who's who's lived it as well. And you're, you're, you're a raw, honest guy as well. So I'm going to get the real the real stuff and I really value that. Mm. Um learning from others that have, have been there too. So uh, thank you. You're the best, mate. All right. Awesome. Get back to your wife. Will do. <laughs> All right. Awesome. See ya. Well, I hope you enjoyed this podcast that I had with James Bartle. Now, if you'd like to hear the rest of my conversation with James and learn about his unique thumbs, yeah, I said thumbs, head on over to patreon.com forward slash justice matters where for as little as five dollars a month you can get access to bonus content and behind the scenes extras you can also interact with myself and the podcast there and on that note i'd like to give a special shout out and thanks to my friend mike mcdonald mate thank you so much for becoming a patreon thank you so much for your support of me and the show 
Now, special mention goes to music artists John Art and David Gungor, also known as The Brilliance, for the music that is used on the podcast. Guys, go check them out. And as always, shout out goes to Jose Biotto for your audio visual expertise in producing the show. And lastly, if you are enjoying this podcast, would you consider rating it and leaving a review, whether it be on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Play, wherever you listen? It goes a long, long way to helping to get this message out there, and I'd really appreciate your reviews and your support. Guys, if you're not liking it, you can ignore what I just said. Don't leave a review. Just move right along. (laughs) But no, in all seriousness, guys, I hope you enjoyed the show today. Join me again soon for another episode of Justice Matters. I am your host, Tim Buxton. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.